Alright, welcome to the network review portion of this course. Going to be going over all the things that we went over in networking one and maybe a couple things that I think are important uh, to know in general that are networking related. Okay, so let's jump into that. Okay, first thing, big picture, big concept. Uh, a lot of you guys struggle with this for some, uh, we're talking about Alfred State uh, at this point. Uh, a lot of you guys struggle with this concept, internet versus intranet. So internet is what we're all used to. So we go to google.com, we hit a web server, and then that web server gives us something back. So that is outside of our internal network. That is the internet, okay? Intranet is the network that is not exposed to the internet. We also call that the local network. So this is really important to understand because this entire course is based on intranet. It's still a network. It still functions the same way. A router is a router, a switch is a switch. It's the same equipment. It's just used a little differently, okay? So both internet and intranet have a series of interconnected devices. That's what a network is. They both use the same networking protocols, your TCP and UDP and everything else in between, all right? The difference is, is what I already babbled on about is the internet has at least one public network exposed to the public that is not secured, right? The World Wide Web is actually just a web standard, but that's what the the three W's mean at this point for most of the world. Internet or intranet allows for sharing of devices in a secure environment that is not exposed to the public network. Okay, so that allows us to do uh, a variety of things uh, in terms of, uh, again, sharing uh, and resource allocation and uh, just going over the network to be a little bit more efficient instead of having all the hardware right there on your desk, okay? So just a review on this page, super important. Internet, public network, at least one. Intranet is a private network and it's local. Okay, networking organizational types, okay? So most of your testing, so your net pluses and on, are going to flop <laughs> from the acronym and then spelling it out for with the full name so you need to know both so we have pan lan can man and wan so most of you have probably heard of lan and wan at this point uh, but these other types are still important as well so lan and wan lan is a local area network wan is a wide area network you guys probably already know this so i'm going to move on PAN, a personal area network, think Bluetooth devices. So something that is very personal, it doesn't have very much space, it does, it's still a network, right? It's still interconnected devices, like these headphones I have right here, Bluetooth enabled, that is a personal area network, okay? CAN, campus area network. So this is a series of internal networks. Alfred State is a good example here, right? where our domain here at CIT is a different network than what the Alfred State campus is. And then the health building has its own domain, which is a different network from ours, but we're all local, okay? Man, metropolitan, so this is typically between buildings within your city, but it's still a private network. And we typically have a VPN to connect these. So we actually have an encrypted tunnel so we can communicate in a secure fashion between our buildings, even though that network traffic still goes over the internet. Okay, so still technically considered a private network. Okay, and then we already went over WAN. So switches. Switches deliver packets. So your internet traffic or your networking traffic based on packets and mac addresses so essentially what happens is is a switch gets a packet and it goes okay here is a mac address that this is supposed to go to for the client that i'm supposed to give this to i'm going to compare this to my uh, table 
And then based on that table, it is assigned to a interface that this is supposed to go to. And then if it matches, I'm going to send it out to this interface. If it doesn't match, it's going to go to everyone. Now, typically this doesn't happen because when you plug in a device into a switch, as soon as that device, uh, as most of the time it's going to be DHCP, uh, the device is going to ask for as soon as that switch gets traffic from a device that it doesn't have in its table it's going to record that device and that MAC address to that interface so you're going to be okay there for the most part but yeah if for some reason that the switch doesn't have that uh, device it's going to send a blast out to all the interfaces and in turn all the devices that are connected to that and hopefully you get a response back that says yes I am this device thank you and then it gets recorded uh, to the table and to the interface okay yeah so the rest of this is standard procedure if for some reason that we get a packet that is not on that switch or not in that table and you didn't get a response back from one of your other devices that says that yes this is intended for me uh, it's going to get sent to the router okay and at that point the router is going to use uh, IP addressing to route that packet to where it goes since we're talking about routers let's move on to that a router's device that routes packets based on IPs okay so basically what's happening here is very similar to what the switch does but it does it through IP so it's going to take that IP it's going to compare its routing table to that IP and whatever interface has that IP is going to send that packet there if it does not have it and it doesn't get a response back uh, then it's going to send it out through the gateway which is going to send it to the internet or at a minimum to a different network um, and that's how we get our router hops and that's essentially what is happening there where it goes okay I don't have the device that this package is looking for I'm going to send it to this other router and hopefully that one has it and that continues until either that packet dies or it actually finds the host that it's supposed to find okay but the key takeaway here is that routers you need a router to switch networks a switch isn't going to be able to do that you have to have a router to do that an access point allows mobile devices like this one access to your network so depending on your policies and depending on your uh, security in general that will limit the device in general but from a physical standpoint from a networking standpoint your access point allows people to access or has uh, access to the network even if it's just to deny uh, a foreign device uh, if you're in a secure environment uh, traditional Wi-Fi standards have always been 802.11 with a letter after it or a series of letters uh, we have since then retroactively went to Wi-Fi 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 uh, but with that said uh, depending on the test and depending on who you're talking to you could easily hear or see the standard of the 802.11 so this is the way that it was invented it is a little odd uh, it went B N G A A C and then A X uh, so your B, N, and G, well, B is your 2.4, your G is a 2.4, a N has uh, 5 gigahertz, A is 5 gigahertz, and then A, C, and A, X are uh, also 5 gigahertz, but how they accomplish those things through different protocols is how we get our higher speed. All right, moving on to MAC addresses, each NIC that is on that device is going to have a unique identifier called the MAC address. So the way the MAC address is actually created is the first half of that MAC address is going to be the organizationally unique identifier. The second half is a serial number from the, the manufacturer itself. Total size is 48 bits as well. So when we were talking about unique identifiers, uh, this is how devices are 
uh, essentially tracked. So from a security standpoint, IP addresses can change all the time. You can spoof a MAC address, uh, but for the most part, this is how people get caught because uh, the MAC address can identify that device. So moving on to IPv4, this is a 32-bit addressing scheme. Uh, it's been around for a long time. We're also out of IPv4. Uh, we created IPv6 to fix that problem. And uh, the reason why IPv version 5 doesn't exist is because when they went and created it, it didn't work. There was problems. So they had to create another version of your internet protocol, which turned into IPv6. Okay. Uh, Private IP addresses are not able to access anything outside of the LAN or PAN, all right? So this is how we actually get a lot of our enterprises uh, to work. So if you are a part of an enterprise, more than likely, uh, your IP addressing scheme is going to be NAT-based, Network Address Translation. And what that does is it takes a private IP address and converts it into a single public IP address so you can actually get to the internet. So what this essentially means is that your device can access the internet, but the internet really can't access your device because it doesn't know how to get to a private IP once it's been converted, okay? So this is also where we got to talk about IP classes. Notice that class A through E all have a designed range. Class E is something that you're not going to see at all because it's reserved for uh, research. And then class D, you're probably not going to see very often either uh, for multicast. But for us, for the people that are actually going to be in the networking field, class A through C is the range that you're probably going to see most often. Also notice that there are gaps in some of these things and those gaps are designed for uh, particular things. Most of the time they're private addresses but sometimes they're there for other purposes. Okay. IPv6, 64-bit instead of 32. Okay, written in hexadecimal, can be assigned to geographical areas. So this is where we start getting into IP addresses tells you where particular network traffic came from. So that is helpful from a security standpoint. Uh, basically, IPv6 is it's a thing. It's out there. Uh, for the most part, we're going to use IPv4, but IPv6 is a thing, and you're going to have to know it eventually. Okay. Cables. We're talking about copper at this point. So RJ45 is by far your most common. That is a Ethernet cable. And then off to the right here is all your Ethernet standards. So if you need uh, particularly fast Ethernet, uh, you need to have the, the correct cable as well to actually support that. However, when we start getting into faster speeds with switches, most of the time that's going to be fiber, but sometimes not. Uh, so there are performance advantages and disadvantages to having both copper and fiber optic. It just depends on what your use case is and what you want to do with it. Okay. So a few things we got to talk about copper cables for is that they're sensitive to EMI interference. Uh, so Essentially what that means is if there's other electricity in the area. So a common example would be uh, light, essentially, anything that pulls a lot of power. Um, that is going to be able to disrupt the communication of those electrons flowing through that copper cable. And one way to fix this is having a twisted uh, copper cable. So just twisting the, the eight little cables that are inside of your ethernet um, helps in part and then shielding the twisted pair so in terms of just reflecting some of that uh, or insulating that copper cable can help you as well so if you have a shielded twisted pair you're pretty much good to go but they are expensive uh, the other thing is is that if the copper cable melts, 
it is toxic. So if you have an AC system, which most server environments do, uh, and there's ever a fire in there, you're putting the entire company at risk because uh, by company, I mean the people in there because the, the copper cables are toxic if they're melted. So um, yeah, there's that. So one last thing I want to talk about copper cables with is that PoE is the only one that's supported uh, over these cables. So if you need power on a single cable, uh, copper cable is the only one that's going to be able to do that. Your Obviously your fiber optic is based on light. It's not going to be able to carry power or electricity. Okay. Moving on to fiber optic. This is based on glass and light. So outside of the disadvantage of not being able to carry power, it comes with significant advantages. One, it's a lot faster and it can travel farther. So if we're talking about traveling farther, your typical copper cable is only about 100 meters before you're gonna have attenuation issues. Uh, your fiber optic cable, about 5,000, 10,000, depending on your equipment. Okay, so a significant difference there. Uh, in terms of modes, we have to talk about modes here. So single mode, there's one glass core, and that means that there's only one index of refraction. So essentially what this is saying that you can't have multiple uh, traffic at one time on a single mode uh, fiber optic cable, but it is a lot cheaper and it can be faster, okay? Because it takes a lot less processing to handle a single mode fiber optic multi-mode kind of the opposite where you can have multiple uh, traffic uh, through your cable, the fiber optic cable, and essentially how this is handled is through different frequencies. So as your light is bouncing through the cable, you can send the light at different angles. So this one can have this frequency to it, and then a different one can have a real low frequency to it and then your switch or your router depending on what you're using can determine what packet that this is supposed to be based on that frequency okay with that said if the cable itself is distorted uh, you're going to have a, a problem so that is a challenge to overcome if you want something like that so moving on protocols HTTP hypertext transfer protocol functions with TCP and it's on port 80 so this is really only useful for intranet web services so if your HR department needs to create a new customer and there's a web app that we have created for them to do that it is in theory uh, reasonable to use HTTP to do that I would still use this next protocol, HTTPS, uh, to make sure that that traffic, even if it's intranet, uh, to make sure that traffic is secure and that uh, there is no man in the middle uh, scenario that we have going on because there is a threshold where companies get big enough where you do have malicious uh, people within your companies and within your walls uh, where that could be a real problem if you have sensitive information, PII, um, out in insecure web traffic, okay? So even intranet, I would still recommend HTTPS, okay? So DNS, domain name system, uh, resolves names, well, networking names in particular. So if one of the uh, servers that I have is named... Uh, I don't know, <laughs> admin server, I guess. Admin server, and I try to ping that, ping admin server, uh, the DNS server would have to take that traffic, compare that name, and then resolve that to an IP address, and then you can ping that server by name. This is exactly what we're doing with uh, our internet addresses. So if I'm going to amazon.com, that amazon.com doesn't actually exist. The, you have to have an IP address. Uh, so a DNS server somewhere is taking amazon.com and resolving it to an IP address, okay? 
Network time protocol, uh, relatively self-explanatory. It's a server that keeps network time, makes sure everything is synchronized. DHCP, dynamic host configuration. So this is how you give your client IP addresses so you don't have to do it manually. Uh, this saves you a bunch of time, if you, especially if you have a bunch of clients. Um, and it gives you other advantages as well, which we'll get into uh, later on in the course. But for the most part, it saves you time and it gives IP addresses out. FTP, file transfer protocol. Uh, there's a secure version of this now. Uh, so this is a thing that exists, but make sure that you're using SFTP, secure file transfer protocol. Okay, SMB, I'm going to be using this a lot for file transfers and file sharing, uh, message or server message block. Okay, and then SSH, secure shell. So secure shell typically and traditionally has been done with SSH uh, that has been replaced by TLS. And that's the same thing with HTTPS as well. Used to be SSH that we would use for that has been replaced with TLS. We're up to 1.2. Uh, most supported is 1.1, uh, but that is changing here. All right, moving on to troubleshooting. There's two models that we can use. Uh, we're going to use the OSI model because it makes more sense for us. If you're going to go take a NetPlus exam or a Cisco exam, they're going to ask you about the TC IP model as well it's a little different and they're all <laughs> depending on who you're talking to depends on how it is defined uh, we're not going to be using that we will be using OSI model so as a network admin you have the first three levels of troubleshooting so you have your physical so check to see if there's power check to make sure that the server itself or client is on Make sure that the cables actually work. Make sure nothing's damaged, okay? The physical layer. And then data, this is where your switch lives, layer two. So make sure that the cable to the switch actually works. Make sure the switch is actually on. Make sure there's not an error on the switch. Make sure that your VLANs are configured correctly, right? Make sure that the data layer works. Make sure your switch actually works. And then the next one is your layer three or router and this is called the network on your OSI model, but make sure that your router configurations are correct. Make sure that your routes are correct. Make sure your gateway is correct. Make sure that the, the router itself is on. Make sure that you have a physical con connection to the router. Make sure that the router itself actually works. And this is where that handoff happens, because if you have a transport layer problem, it's either software or it's the ISP. It's really not you. So you'll have a hand in it, but you're going to have to seek help at that point. Um, ses session, presentation, and application. Again, uh, it's either going to be the ISP or a problem with the software itself, whatever you're trying to troubleshoot. Okay. All right, moving on to hashing. Uh, this is a relatively simple concept to understand uh, as long as you're not making the hashing algorithm. Uh, what hashing is there to do is to make sure that you don't have a man in the middle issue. So it is a way of making sure that your data hasn't been viewed or altered in transit. Okay, your common hashing algorithms is your SHA-256 and MD5. Those are your common ones. Um, yeah, there are others out there, but these are the ones you're gonna see. All right, moving on to encryption. Encryption is a way of obscuring data. With that said, most people, most business people in particular, don't really wanna hear that. It is a secure uh, data set if it is encrypted. Uh, the reality is, is that any encryption algorithm can be broken eventually. Uh, AES-256 uh, isn't yet. Uh, if quantum computing comes online relatively uh, quickly, then AES-256 is not going to be a problem for that. So encryption, by its nature, is a way of obscuring data. It's a, it's a deterrent. 
for hackers taking raw data that is encrypted and trying to decrypt it. Uh, with that said, most places, most people, most of the time when we're talking about encryption, they're going to call it secure. Okay, so just keep that in mind. AES is the standard right now, AES 256. Uh, if you have an opportunity to do that and it's not going to hurt your performance in any significant way, make sure you're using AES 256. There are others out there. We have Triple Des, RSA, Blowfish, Twofish. Okay. Yeah, and quantum computing, once that comes online, it's um, we're going to have to have some significant changes, and who knows what the future will hold when that happens. All right, so that's the end of the slideshow. If you made it this far, again, good for you. If um, you needed more work on that networking concept overview, uh, make sure you look on LinkedIn Learning. You do have a subscription there that the school has paid for, and you can go over those concepts a little bit more thoroughly. Uh, they have better animations than I do. Uh, they have a little bit more resources than I do as well. Uh, so the, the production quality is going to be a little bit better. But uh, if you need to review that, go ahead and hit up LinkedIn Learning, do Networking One Concepts. It's going to be a lot of this, and hopefully it sticks a little bit more for you. However, for this course, we're going to have to move on. So the next thing that we're going to have to do is hardware, and that's going to be another review session. So it's going to be a lot of this is what this is, this is what this does, and then we're not going to necessarily do or practice any of it because in theory it should just be a review so with that said i'll see you in the next one